Thank you very much, Ethan. Okay, we're good. We are good to go. We're good to go. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Thank you, Ethan, for having uh, organized this program. We'd like to uh, thank all of you who are paying attention who came to the class. I'll start with the uh, personal things, and then we'll go to our more formal things. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, among Jews from Turkey and the island of Rhodes. My grandmother, Romy, my mother's mother, came to Seattle from Marmara, island of Marmara. She was functionally illiterate her entire life. Um, she couldn't read. She couldn't write. She didn't know English very well. She spoke Ladino her whole life. But she was brilliant and she was powerful. And she raised a family of seven children, had many grandchildren, and was a matriarch of our family, a person who was highly respected and very lovable and very beloved. My mother was the second of her children, but she was only a girl. In those days, if you were only a girl, you didn't need much education. You went to school as long as you were required, which to age 16. And then you got a job and helped support the family. And then you got married and had your own family. And my mother at age 16 had to quit school. Her teacher came to my grandfather, Romy, and said, Mr. Romy, your daughter is brilliant. She's a wonderful student. Let her finish high school. She could go to college. My grandfather, a blessed memory, was a wonderful, wonderful man. Came from Turkey, from a city called Takirda. And he said, look, I have seven kids. And I'm a barber. I don't make very much money. And I need her to go to work. Her older sister's already working in the candy factory. And my daughter, Rachel, which is my mother, also has to work in the candy factory. So my mother quit school and she worked at the candy factory. Were my grandmother and mother successes or not successful? Okay, depends on our standards. None, neither of them was college educated. Neither of them was a professor, a financier, a lawyer, a doctor. Neither of them was a politician. Neither of them was known outside of the relatively small circle of their uh, family and synagogue community. So on one standard, they were failures. But on my standard, they were phenomenally successful people. They raised beautiful families. They were very loving. We wouldn't be who we were without them. My mother was extremely well read. She read everything from philosophers, literature, when I got my PhD back in the olden days, I was very proud. I was the first member of the family to get a PhD. And I came back to Seattle and I said, mom, I studied with many, many great professors. I studied with phenomenal scholars, but I never came across anyone as smart as you. My mother blushed, but it was true. I wasn't flattering her. She was brilliant, very well read, very thoughtful, very deep, very deep person, very deep thinking person but she wasn't successful. If she'd been born one, two generations later, she'd be vice president of the United States today, or she would be head of a corporation, or she'd be a professor of literature in University of Washington or Columbia University or wherever else. We stopped to think that women in the United States didn't have the right to vote until the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920. So it's basically 100 years ago. Until 100 years ago, Women didn't even have the right to vote in this country, which is the most progressive Western society. We have been living through a revolution, radically changing our social mores. Yes, we're exceedingly grateful to our mother and grandmother and all of the women of all the generations who lived behind the scenes, whose great genius was to raise beautiful, loving families, who taught us religious values, ethical values, who taught us to be who we are. And our fathers and grandfathers were wonderful. But at least in my case, and I think in many people's cases, the warmth, the love, the beauty came from our mothers and from our grandmothers. Our society wouldn't be what it is, and we wouldn't be as who we are without all their accomplishments. Having said all that, the world in which my mother and grandmother lived is radically different. Our daughters, thank God, I would say, have many more opportunities than did our mothers and grandmothers. Our wives, our, the women of our generation, had many more opportunities 
than the generations before. And these opportunities brought many, many positive things and many things that caused turbulence. Whenever there's change, especially radical change, affecting a whole society, it's very, very difficult to know how to function. Um, it's very difficult. And we're gonna discuss some of the issues in the talk tonight. I'm, I don't wanna to philosophize too much. I'll give a little bit of historical background. I wanna talk a little bit about halakhic background, how there have been changes in halakha or questions about halakha, how we've adapted to new situations. And then I wanna just spend a few minutes predicting things for the future. Even though I'm only an angel and not a prophet, I like to think about the future as I think we all do. Well, I wanna talk to start with um, women from the Western Sephardic tradition who are more educated in the Western sense of the term. So the first woman that I would like to talk about briefly is a woman named Grace Aguilar. She was a novelist, a writer, a religious writer, who was lived in England during the, she was born in 1816. <clears throat> she became a very popular novelist in general England, not just, not just for Jews, but to non-Jews read her work as well. One of her concerns was that Judaism was live, we were now living in a modern era. We weren't living, this is in England now, where Jews were just starting to get rights and just starting to advance in society. And we're not living in ghettos in the same sense that they had been living in previous generations. Just the cusp of modernity. And what she was afraid of was that the Jewish community was having the problem of bifurcation. On the one hand, there were those who clung to the tradition. And on the other hand, there were people who broke away from Judaism altogether or who stopped being very observant. And one of her concerns was that especially girls we're not receiving adequate Jewish education. So in her books, she stressed the Bible, she stressed following the, the rituals, but she stressed education for girls. She said, if we want the Jewish community to flourish, it's going to be imperative that our girls are no longer simply considered as an afterthought. They can't just be taught at home and taught the laws of Kashrut and Shabbat and whatever it is, because guess what? Our girls also have brains. They can think, they can learn, and they have to have opportunities. If the non-Jewish girls are starting to go to schools and get, get higher education, we can't have Jewish girls fall behind. Moreover, those Jews who do go to more general education, higher education, they tend to drift away from Judaism. Why? Because they're not given enough intellectual foundations to remain Jewish, solidly Jewish. So this was her writing and it had a very big impact, but of course the forces against her were also very great. In the early 20th century in the United States, we had several other very impressive women of Sephardic background who, who were members of Congregation Sherath Israel, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in New York, where I was rabbi, I started there in 1969 as student rabbi. I'm old and gray now. When I started, I was a 24 year old rabbi or student rabbi. It's an amazing congregation. It was an amazing congregation. And I am grateful to God that I was able to spend so many years there. Anyway, during the early 20th century, my grandparents, many Sephardic grandparents were coming to the United States from Turkey, from Syria, from Greece. Some spoke Ladino, some spoke Arabic, some spoke Greek mixture of people, mixture of languages. They came here, most of them, without much formal education, without much money, but with a dream. They came to America because they wanted to succeed, because they heard that America is a land of opportunity. So my grandparents' generation and that immigrant generation of the early 1900s, they came here with the old country with them. You don't just leave a culture behind you bring much of it with you and you have to adapt. So my grandparents, as I told you, my grandmother only spoke Ladino her whole life. She could never speak English properly. My grandfather who could speak English and became an American citizen, but spoke with a very thick accent and mostly Spanish. He didn't, my parents, both of them were born in Seattle. They didn't learn English until they went to public school. They grew up in a home 
that was uh, Judeo-Spanish speaking. My parents, used, I say it as a joke, but it's not a joke. I grew up in Seattle. I knew it was a Jewish neighborhood because everyone in the neighborhood spoke Spanish. That was the way it was. All the old timers in that generation, if you walk down the street, the, the language they had spoke was, was Ladino, Judeo-Spanish. They brought the old country with them. And the old country was women are still to stay home, to get married, to have kids, to be good cooks, to, to sing the old folk songs, and to be a wonderful source of warmth and beauty. They could be in sisterhoods. They were very good in sisterhoods. And what do they do in sisterhoods? They raise money to support the synagogue. How did they raise money? They cook borekas, they cook beautiful things, they had bazaars, and uh, there's the one wonderful. I don't diminish the importance of any of those things. But there was a clear understanding that there was a role for men, i.e. the leadership, the men were supporting the families, and the women were behind the scenes active. So my family, my father would never let my mother work. In that generation, my, I had an Auntie Florence who happened to be Ashkenazic, so she worked, she worked outside the home. But all my aunties, they didn't work out. They worked out, they stayed home. The husband was supposed to be the breadwinner and in all cases, that's how it worked. But then they had to raise children and they wanted their children to be Americans. So I say this as a, a, a joke, but it's not a joke. My middle name is Dwight, Mark D. Angel, D is Dwight. That tells you I was born in July, 1945. Who was a great hero of America? None other than Dwight David Eisenhower. I was named after Eisenhower. My first name, Mark, is after my grandfather, Romy, Marco Romy, my mother's father. So I was second born, second born uh, son. So I'm named after my grandfather, my mother's father. But the, um, my mother was an American. She wanted us to be American. And so at home, we only spoke English. To the old timers, we listened to them in Spanish, but we only answered back in English. And our kids, they, they only know English. Ladino is just a distant memory for them. We sing uh, 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 the Bracat Amazon in Ladino. We, we sing some parts of the Haggadah in Ladino. Okay, but by and large, that's, that's the thing in the past. My wife is Ashkenazi. She's a better Sephardic Jew than most Sephardic Jews. She wrote a Sephardic cookbook, but our traditions, we grew up in different, different religious traditions. So going back to my experience at Sheriff Israel, in the early 20th century, when the Sephardim were coming in, <clears throat> the existing Jewish immigrant societies didn't know that there were such a thing as Sephardim. So they sent people to come to the peers to meet the immigrants coming off the boats, and they greeted them in Yiddish. And if they answered them in Yiddish, they said, oh, you're Jewish, you come to us. There's a place we'll give you some food, we'll give you a place to stay, we'll help you get a job. There were societies the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society is the, the most famous, but there were other groups also that helped the immigrants. If they heard someone speak Spanish or Arabic or Greek, they, they didn't think they were Jewish. You know, if, they, if the name was Angel or al Hadas or ben Olil or whatever name, it's too, too exotic, it didn't, didn't work. So they, they, uh, they didn't get identified as Jews. So Sheriff Israel had a group of women, many of whom have, are at least of Sephardic ancestry, who decided to build or to buy a settlement house on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where many of the immigrants were settling in. And these, so they would go to the, to the uh, piers and they would meet immigrants and they would try to help them adapt to American life. So these settlement houses had little synagogues, they had schools for the children, Talmud Torah, they had English classes, they had uh, job placement, et cetera, et cetera. One of the ladies who was very involved in that was a woman named Maud Nathan. Maud Nathan's ancestors were in the United States going back to colonial days. She was a daughter of the American Revolution. She was also a suffragette. She used to speak around the world, mainly in America, but around the world uh, for women's rights. At one of her speeches, she made an impassioned uh, speech that women should be allowed to vote. So someone in the audience got up, a man, of course, and said, Miss, Mrs. Nathan, would you want your cook to vote? And she answered, he does, <laughs> he does. And that shut him up. In other words, the, the thing should not be based on gender. It should be based, everyone has rights, whether they're female or male. Ultimately, she won the day. But she was very involved in that and she wrote books uh, about her work. One of the things she did was she worked for a thing called the Consumer, uh, Consumer Aid Society, the Consumer League. And that was to work for people to have 
equal rights. What does it mean? In those days, the department stores used to hire mainly young girls, young women, and they just exploited them. They paid very low wages. The women had to stay standing up the whole day. They had very little time off for lunch. Um, the facilities were very, very poor for them. So Maud Nathan and other women, mostly Christian women, were involved in a thing called the Consumer League. And what was a Consumer League? Basically, they said, we're going to make a white list. A white list means instead of blacklisting companies, we're going to have a white list of those companies that have good standards for working women. And we're going to ask our consumers only patronize those stores where women workers have good rights, where they're treated properly. The idea was that if the, the consumers have more power than they realize. And so it was, it became a great success. The New York Consumers League expanded to the National Consumers League, and then there was an International Consumers League. So here was one woman in the early 1900s who made a much bigger difference than just sitting at home. But she did, she had a big impact on the world. And one of her contemporaries was a woman named Alice Mencken, also of old Sephardic family in New York. Alice Mencken was, um, she was involved in prison reform. She used to have a group of women from the Sierra Israel Sisterhood that used to go down to night court in New York City. In those days, girls were very, very poor. And some of them fell into the wrong hands and became prostitutes. They had very unsavory lives. They didn't know how to make a living. Their parents didn't know how to take care of them, how to control them. So these women from the Sheriff Israel were very fancy ladies, would go to night court. And every time there was a Jewish girl, Sephardic or Ashkenazi, it didn't matter, that was in trouble, they swore, they took responsibility. They said, we will bail her out and we will take care of her. And they, she, uh, this Alice Mekin actually took one woman to her house for two years <laughs> and married her off and she lived a nice happy life. But these were people who were socially apt. They cared about the society around them and they were able to do things about them. In many synagogues, in many uh, communities, whether the Western Sephardic tradition or in general, there were always women who cared beyond their family, who worked for the community at large, who worked for the, the schools, who worked for the uh, federations, who worked for Zionism, who worked for the war efforts when the United States was at war. There was a group in Seattle, my mother was a member of many women of that generation were members. They used to knit uh, for, for, the, uh, for the soldiers, they used to knit things. And um, they were called the Sephardic Do Our Bit Club. And they even kept minutes they were very, and had uniforms. But there were women who realized that they had talents and they had skills and they had a desire to play a bigger role in life than just their family. Their family is wonderful. And I don't, again, don't diminish that at all. But they had a sense that they were growing and the world was changing and they wanted to be part of a bigger world. Well, when you want to become part of a bigger world and you live in a society that's not quite adapted, not quite changed yet, what do you do? So I always say my mother, who was, as I said, I keep telling you, she was brilliant and very well read. And, and, and among her peers, there were also Sephardic men and women who were very well autodidacts. They read a lot, they thought a lot. But many of the people were laborers. They owned stores. They were fine people, wonderful people. I wouldn't want to be born among any other people. I, I, I'm very proud and, and, and glad I grew up where I grew up. But I had one, my father was a grocer. One uncle was a fish market, had a fish market. One uncle was, I had a butcher shop. One uncle was a printer. They were laborers. They, they were not philosophers. These were not uh, uh, people with academic degrees. They were good, solid, salt of the earth, hardworking men. But they didn't, doesn't mean they didn't think. It didn't mean that they didn't have aspirations. But the world was still the way it was. It was still part of the old world tugging at them. They didn't know how to deal exactly with changing in America. The changes in America weren't only here. They were all over the world. Women all over the world, Jewish women, including very religious women, were starting to realize that there is a fundamental change in, in society at large. We can no longer play the game the way it was played for the last hundreds of years. There are opportunities 
that are now opening up and we wanna share in them. It doesn't mean we're throwing away the old system, but it means we have rights, we are people, and we're not just chattel. And we don't just tag along with our husbands. We have an identity of our own. In early 20th century in Israel, which was before the state of Israel, they used to have Moshavim, little, little uh, settlements. And there were questions whether in that, those settlements, women had the right to vote and whether they had the right to be elected to be leaders of those settlements. So the Ashkenazic rabbis in general, led it by Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, for example, was very much against it. That women belong at home. It's not nice, it's not moral for women to go to polling places and stand in line with men. It's conducive to immorality, frivolity. Men and women mingling together is not, it's not kosher, not a good idea. Women should stay home where they belong and the decision should be made by the man. Moreover, said Ralph Cook, there should be one vote per family because if you have the man who's a Democrat and the woman is a Republican, this is in Israel, they had different parties, they'll fight with each other, they'll end up getting divorced. This was Rabbi Cook's thinking and the majority of the Ashkenazic establishment followed that suit. But there was a young Sephardic rabbi at that time, Rabbi Ben Sion Uziel, who had a different view. And his argument was based not on sociology, not on history, but on a simple ethical issue. He said, I have a practical question. If people are living in a community and the community has rules, including taxation, they could tax us. They make rules that we can do and can't do. Is it fair for a community to have rules where we have no voice in it at all? Is it ethical to expect us to pay taxes follow rules when we had no input at all, nothing to say about it. We're simply like considered like pet dogs. So Rabbi Uziel said, it's not ethical. It's not ethical. Women have rights equal to men. Why? Women are subject to the same laws, the same rules. It's not, it would not be unethical to deprive women of the right to vote. Ah, we have a long tradition of women not voting. It was, as I said before, in the United States, which was a highly modern Western society, women couldn't vote till 1920. So it, it's, it's a follow, relatively new, new thing. But in Rabbi Uziel's day, which was also early 20th century, it wasn't common to pe for people to think that women have a right to vote. Rabbi Uziel had a different insight. The insight isn't a sociological uh, discussion. It's an ethical discussion. Ah, we have a historical tradition. If you look at all the halakhic literature, the rabbinic literature going back for centuries, no one says women can vote. And Rabbi Uziel said, yes, you know why? Because it never was, they never thought about it. It really wasn't relevant to them. They lived in a society, in a setting that didn't call for women to vote. Women themselves didn't, weren't aware of it. But are, we don't live in that society anymore. There is a change. There's a sociological, psychological, philosophical change. And we have to adapt to that change. Ah, there's a, there are halakhic sources that say women should not be in uh, control of men. Women shouldn't have the same rights as men. He says, you know what? If a society agrees of its own free will to give equal rights to all of its members, then it's permissible. So Rabbi Uziel said, yes, women can vote. So the question said, came up, can women be leaders? Can women be elected? And there was a lot of opposition to it. A woman elected over men? Women controlling men? Who ever heard of such a thing, right? <laughs> that's how, that's how, how little people understood life. Women often control men, but okay, not a side story. Rabbi Uziel said, there's a precedent. He, fi he found response going back to medieval Spain, actually, that showed if a community of its own free will decides to accept as leaders, people who are halakhically not allowed to be leaders or judges who aren't allowed to be judges, it's okay. If the community accepts, let's say for example, if I have a case, a legal case, and it's with Mr. X, and I say, Mr. X, I wanna to go to a, a rabbi to judge us, and the rabbi happens to be my son, is that legal or not? Of course, it's not legal. You can't have a, a relative be a judge. What happens if Mr. X says, you know, your son is so honest, I agree to that. I agree to have your son be the judge. 
is he allowed, are we allowed now to have our case decided by my son? The answer is yes. If both parties agree, then it's okay. So Uziel extends that. He said, if a community votes and they elect a woman as the chair of the community or in whatever position they offer, they vote her in, that means the community as a community has a consensus that it's okay for this person to rule or to lead. And even though technically you could find halakhic sources that would be against it, you could also find halakhic sources that justify it on this basis. On the same basis, by the way, he also justified having non-Jewish witnesses in a civil court in Israel. He said, we're gonna have a Jewish state and we're gonna have non-Jewish citizens. Is it fair not to allow them to testify in court? It wouldn't be fair. And therefore he said, if society itself has rules that permit people who ordinarily wouldn't halakhically be permitted, then it's okay. But it wasn't just a matter of giving women right to vote. Sometimes people change not because they thought about it and they needed to vote, but there were so, so certain sociological changes. So this also showed itself up in the way people dressed. So we know that our mothers and grandmothers always dress very modestly. It's correct, they should dress modestly, beautiful, wonderful. But we also know that historically, one of the traits of Jewish modesty was for married women to have their head covered. They wore hats, or bonnets, or scarves. In the Ashkenazic world, they wore wigs, which is another question. But the, it was common, and still is common among in much of the Orthodox world for women to cover their hair. A question came to Rabbi Yosef Messas, who was born in Morocco, who became the chief rabbi in Haifa, a very progressive rabbi. He was an old rabbi with a big, long white beard, very learned, but he had a strong progressive streak. And the question came to him as follows, is Rabbi Messas, we don't understand it. How come the, wife, the wives of the religious functionaries in Morocco don't cover their hair? They didn't, they, they, the question itself presupposes that the women already weren't covering their hair. And this was in Muslim societies. They were already getting modernized. They were already getting French, Frenchified by the influence of France. People with Allianz schools, they became more modern. They liked Western fashions. Women started wearing low cut, lower cut dresses, which is nice. But the question of the hair covering, Rabbi Massa said, yes, traditionally, women were supposed to cover their hair. And why? Because in those days, in those societies, that was a sign of a modest woman. And if a woman walked in the public, a married woman walked in public with her hair uncovered, that was very immodest and people would think very bad thoughts about her. And it was a sign that she discarded laws of morality. But we don't live at that time anymore. Fashions have changed. Most women, he's talking about in his society, and certainly even more so in Western society, most women don't cover their hair. Non-Jewish women don't cover their hair. So we're telling married women, married Jewish women have to walk with scarves on their hair. But the men are walking in the street, they see all kinds of beautiful non-Jewish women walking with their hair uncovered. So he says, how is that, how is that virtuous? Or why should Jewish women be penalized because they're Jewish? They should also be allowed to keep their hair uncovered. It's a custom, sociological custom rather than a halakha. Many rabbis disagreed with him. Many rabbis today disagree with him. Rabbi Uziel disagreed with him. But I don't disagree with him. I think it makes a lot of sense. In other words, the goal of Jewish modesty is to be modest, to be polite, to be proper, not to be uh, sexually um, promiscuous. In our society, walking with your hair uncovered is not promiscuous at all. All the women do that, walk that way. And to have to cover your hair, if you want to, no one says you shouldn't, you're welcome to. But if you don't want to, if you want to follow the current style, you can follow the current style, according to Rabbi Massas, and I happen to agree with him. I'll quote Rabbi Massas, I'm quoting English translation. Since in our time, all the women of the world have voided the previous practice and have returned to the simple practice of uncovering their hair, there is nothing in this that constitutes brazenness or lack of modesty. Therefore, the prohibition of covering one's hair has been lifted. Well, there are other laws that are, if you look at the, at the Shulchan Aruch, at the Rambam, there are other laws that, guard, that were made in order to guard mo modesty. And what happens today is 
that many of them, many of these laws really are not kept even in the most observant uh, schools. So for example, there's one law that says a single woman is not allowed to teach in a, in a Jewish school or a single man is not allowed to teach. Why? Because after school, the parents come to pick up their kids. And if there's a single woman and the father's picking up his kids, uh-oh, he sees a, a Jewish girl teacher, he'll fall in love with her. Or vice versa, there's a single man teaching, he'll fall in love with the mothers of the children. So that was against the rules. How many schools today follow that rule? Even in the Maharadi world, they, they train girls to be teachers. And there's, there's single, a lot of single girls teaching and a lot of single men teaching until they get married. There are various laws, which I don't say get, get voided, we don't throw the laws out, but there's just uh, an evolution. I don't, I don't call it revolution, it's evolution. Things gradually change, even in, in um, very traditional societies. And when women, assert themselves and say, we want to follow, not to, not to be immodest, God forbid, but we want to follow the proper fashions of the day without immodesty. They should be allowed to do that. Another question that comes up often is called kol isha. There's a rule that men are not allowed to listen to women singing. Now, I know from personal experience that many religious pious men listen to their women singing Ladino songs. I grew up with the women, my mother, grandmother, they always sang. No one ever said, keep quiet, you're not allowed to sing. It was, it was normal. I remember going to a conference with Chacham Gaon, may less, rest in peace, Chacham Solomon Gaon. And at that conference, um, there was a woman singing Ladino songs. She sang beautifully. And the Chacham got up and praised her to the sky. That's the most beautiful rendition. And what are these songs? They're love songs. They're beautiful love songs. And Chacham Gaon, who was a man of great piety, didn't have any problem at all. Why? It was natural. It was normal. One thing we had in the Sephardic world, not all the Sephardic world, but in some of the Sephardic world, I call a naturalness, a comfortable, a comfort level with life. And we don't get hung up about everything. Some things are right and some things are wrong. That's correct. We have to, there are laws, there are rules. But there are other, I call it more gray area, where a society has its own sociological way of evolving and where these things don't become so, so um, problematic. Now, in our, let me talk about the modern time right now. What's happening in the Sephardic world? I'll use an Eskenazic term, oi, oi ve. A lot of good things, a lot of good things, but a lot of problematic things. On one level, many Sephardim who become religious or who are religious go to an extreme. They follow a very Haredi point of view. The men wear black hats. They look like Ashkenazic rabbis or Ashkenazic. They go to Ashkenazic yeshivot. They become Ashkenazicized. They become more extreme. They take, they adopt more extreme positions. And in those kind of synagogues that are run by those kind of rabbis and community members, women's rights almost aren't even a question. They don't have rights. In the old days, when they built synagogues, by and large, there wasn't even a woman's section because they didn't expect a woman to come to the synagogue. Or if they had a woman's section, it was you know, relegated to the back or upstairs and out of the way because they didn't expect a woman to come. What happens if women want to come to synagogue? What happens if women say, you know, I have a spiritual aspiration I want to be part of the community like the, like, like the men. It doesn't mean that our mothers and grandmothers who didn't have that same drive to be part of the synagogue were less religious. They were very pious too. My mother, of blessed memory, came to, she used to call herself a three day a year Jew. She used to come to Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. She didn't come on Shabbat. She was too busy preparing lunch for everybody for Shabbat. She didn't come very, she very rarely came to synagogue. Spiritual, she was one of the most spiritual religious women in the history of the world. Magnificent, magnificent. But not, but her, to tell her, you have to go to synagogue every Shabbat. Or my grandmother wasn't even part of their desire. Yes, but their grandchildren, their great grandchildren are different. We live at a different time now. So on the one side, Sephardic synagogues become, are becoming more ethnic, smaller, more narrow, and it's more difficult to, to break new ground there. On the other side, there are many Sephardic Jews who are basically have defected from religion altogether. 
or they keep just a few things. They, they have a Seder uh, for, for Pesach and they eat a Boreka once in a while, but kosher or not kosher, they don't, not too fussy about it. And they have a desire for egalitarianism. I was speaking with some people from a Sephardic synagogue that's having women issues where the women want more rights, they want to be called to the Torah, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I said, look, there's, there are two movements existing in the United States now, the conservative and reform movement that have total egalitarianism, where women can go to synagogue, they can go to temple, they can be called to the Torah, they can be rabbis, everything egalitarian. And if you look at the statistics, I think less than 6%, 7% of reform Jews claim to go to synagogue or temple once a week or more. They almost never come, men or women. So they're all demanding rights and rights and rights, but if you give them rights, they're not gonna to come to a synagogue more often anyway. So you're, you're selling out your old traditions for a, a replacement that's not gonna serve the purpose. Okay, so you have on the one hand, a closing of opportunities, and the other hand, a desire to open opportunities outside of the halakhic framework. And where are the rest of us supposed to be? And we're good, I'm assuming, we're all good, nice Jews, observant Jews, or at least we live within that, or we want to live within some general traditional Sephardic framework. How do we balance these completing things? If we go to one extreme, we put women back two generations. If we go this way, we sell out our future generations. There's a, there have been all kinds of studies that they, they, uh, you can check on the, on the Google. There's a, there's a website, I think, will your children be Jewish in a hundred years from now? And if you, if you identify now as reform, in a hundred years, there'll be four, four people left that'll be Jews. If you identify as Haredi or ultra-Orthodox, a hundred years from now, there'll be 3,500 Jews. These are all extrapolated from the statistics. In other words, if you give away so much of the tradition, eventually it just fizzles away and people stop being religious at all. They stop being Jewish at all. If you keep too much of it, you might be multiplying and multiplying and multiplying, but many Jews are not comfortable in that setting. So here's what I think. I'm not gonna give a, a final answer. We could, if you have questions, you might be able to discuss it. There have to be ways within a traditional framework where men and women can sit in the same room and say, what is the future of our synagogue? What do we want our granddaughters, our daughters and granddaughters to feel like when they come to synagogue? How can we make our synagogues without compromising halakha? How could we make them more meaningful, spiritually attractive to our young men and our young girls, our young men and young women? I don't think we talk enough, seriously enough about our, our communities. We let it, the rabbi decides, the, the president of the shul decides, president of the synagogue decides, a few of the big shots decide. It's not gonna be decided that way. It has to be decided by the grassroots. In serious, non-confrontational, no calling names, no yelling, where there's uh, ground rules, where our concern is, how can we make our synagogues, our community organizations more I don't like to use the word egalitarian, but more respectful to men and women so that men and women can feel a stake in it and can contribute to it. And I wanna just make one more point before closing and opening to questions. It's so silly for the Jewish people to forfeit one half of our talent. If women represent 50% of our talent, I think they're actually 52% are women, but let's say 50%, why in the world would we not want to draw on that 50% of talent. What sense does it make from a, from a pragmatic point of view? The answer is it doesn't make sense at all. It hurts us. It hurts us as a community. It hurts us as a people. That doesn't mean we should throw away our tradition. I'm, I'm an Orthodox rabbi committed to halakha. I'm, I don't compromise on halakha. But the halakha is much more generous and much more open than we're often willing to entertain. The voices of religious right, leaders tend to be strident and they restrict, they don't want change. And the other side, people who are not so religious want all kinds of change, but they don't think about what's gonna be one, two, three generations down. 
But there have to be enough of us who care not only about ourselves, but care about two, three generations down the line. How are we gonna keep our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, Jewishly happy, Jewishly meaningful, Jewishly committed. And that's gonna require the best brains and the best energy of all of our men and all of our women. We can't afford to leave anybody out. That's my message for tonight. We'll have questions or comments. I'll be happy to respond. Okay, Ethan, I'm stopping here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments, please enter them to the chat. And we're going to read them out and get to as many as we can in the time that we have for this evening. Uh, one question I personally had, I was curious of your insights. You mentioned the challenges that the conservative reform movement faced with, uh, with uh, multi-generational sustainability when it comes to changing certain rules and certainly the Orthodox community conversely has that challenge. How does the Sephardic world avoid kind of falling into these buckets and these sectarianisms that have occurred in the Ashkenazic world? Because it was very, it's a very unnatural thing for the Sephardic world to have sex, right? In that sense, because it just didn't exist. How does the Sephardic world going forward now avoid that for the sake of unity and, and for growth? A very good question, but I'm gonna to have to question the question. There's no such thing as the Sephardic world. Every community is different. The Syrian community in Brooklyn is very different from the Ladino community in Sephardic Bikr Cholim in Seattle, which is different from the Ezra Sarath in Seattle, which is different from Atlanta, which is different from Indianapolis, which is different from Chicago. We're all different people. And a Moroccan synagogue or an Iranian synagogue or a Turkish synagogue or a Greek synagogue, each one has its own personality and its own needs. I often think the problem is that we don't think seriously enough about our future. Some people think we're in, we're in danger and the only way we could save ourselves is by building higher walls. Stri strict, the stricter we are, the bigger our walls are, the more traditional we are, the more demands we make on our people, the more we're gonna survive as a Sephardic or Jewish community. And there's logic in it. I don't say no. It's not for me. It's not for most of our team, by the way. I don't believe. But each community just needs to sit down and figure out its own constituency. I always think, wouldn't it be nice if, or even the old timers, I call myself an old timer now, the, old, the grandparents' generation and the great grandparents' generation just sat in the room and said, where are our grandchildren right now? Often in the United States, they don't even live in the same town. It's a very mobile society, they live all over the country or in Israel, they live all over. Where are those, those who are in our vicinity? Are they part of our community? Are they active in our community? What turns them on, what turns them off? Why aren't they with us? In other words, it requires soul searching. And we should stop and think of another thing. It's not a Sephardic issue per se. There were, um, the Pew, PEW study has just shown for the first time in American history since they started, or the Gallup poll, the first time in American history since they started taking polls, that less than 50% of Americans belong to churches or synagogues or mosques. It's the first time. The whole American society is radically changing in a way that's moving away from traditional religious forms. That's a fact. That's much bigger than just the Jewish community. It's a fact. Now, we could deny the fact, but it doesn't help us to deny it. Our kids and grandkids, if they go to universities, they're gonna be brought in graduate schools and wherever they're gonna be, they're gonna be impacted by the general phenomena that are affecting our whole society. There's a movement against the establishment. And that's a challenge. I don't have all the answers, I wish I did. As I say, I'm only an angel, I'm not God. But I know that one thing I feel, we're not thinking seriously enough about it. We're not having grassroots serious discussions in our communities, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what we could do better. And not only just to talk to ourselves, but to find those who are, have moved away from us and listen to them. What is it that, that's turned you off? What is it that can turn you back on, if anything? But unless we're having this dialogue and, and soul searching, nothing's gonna happen. It'll just continue to go down the line. And I think that's what's scary to me. I think to, to assume that we're on a train that'll just go by itself without having to think about it, that's our biggest mistake because the train's gonna go off track, folks. I hate to tell you that. 
we have to think and be in the steering wheel. So another question that came up into the chat. Um, thank you so much, Rabbi, for those, those insightful thoughts. Um, another question from the chat. In terms of the halakha, where do you draw the line in terms of modernity? Isn't it a simply slope? The more you open up, in a sense, the more uh, you can stop the progress. I ask, I'm, I'm asked that question very often. Aren't you worried about the slippery slope? Once you permit something, aren't you afraid something else is going to happen, something else is going to happen, and then it will just slide down? And you know what? I answer yes. I am afraid of the slippery slope. But I'm also afraid of freezing ourselves into relics. They're both fears. I am afraid of opening up too much because, yes, you open up too much and you never know where things are going to end. But if you don't open up at all, you're simply a fossil. I don't want to be a fossil. I want my grandchildren and great-grandchildren to live Judaism happily, richly, beautifully. I don't want them to live just in a hole, in a trap. I don't want them to think that Judaism only is one little sect. It's not a sect. It's a great it's a world religion. And we have to convey that. So I'm afraid of a slippery slope and that's why everything has to be done cautiously and thoughtfully. Nothing radical, I'm not a radical. But I'm also not um, frozen in stone. There has to be some give and take. And if there's not give and take, we're all ultimately going to lose. You can't win uh, without change. Organisms evolve, people change, society changes, ideas change. We're not the same thing as our grandparents. Our grandchildren are not to be the same thing that we are. And we have to be able to understand that a living organism grows and changes. And even though it's painful sometimes, we have to realize that's gonna happen anyway and try to stay as much in control as we can and keep the, the general picture of what we want uh, for the future to be and then work towards that goal. But we can't do it on our own. It's not one rabbi or one thinker or one president dictating the future. It's not gonna happen that way. It has to happen with the people, the masses of people. The decisions can be made not by the big shots. The decisions can be made by the communities. Another question here in the chat. Uh, some Sephardic people make uh, Aliyah to Israel now say that they live in Israel. They don't need to be observant. Uh, that the, the need to be observant really was just a, a, a situation with the diaspora. How do you respond to that? Uh, they're depriving themselves of something very important. Religious observance isn't just a set of rituals that we do because we have to do them and keep our, to keep our Jewish identity. Jewish rituals actually have great power within them. They bring us great happiness, great fulfillment. And if you don't have that, the ritual sense, you also lose out a whole lot. So yes, living in Israel is wonderful. And you could live in Israel and you speak Hebrew and you, you have a mezuzah on your door and the, the society has the general Jewish tone to it. If it's just a matter of identity, yes, but we're not just identity. We're also spiritual beings. We also have souls. It's not just a question of identity. And what people often don't realize is that our religion, the, the Torah and the Mizvot, aren't just a, a bunch of random laws to, to keep us in line. They're doors that open that give us opportunities. They make us grow. They help us think beyond ourselves. So anyone who thinks that religious ritual is just for identity, they, they don't understand religious ritual. Sorry. Another question in the other chat. What in your opinion do you think is the ideal case for um, for a balanced observance to allow women more prominence and more of a role in synagogue life? As I said before, I think each community is a little bit different. Uh, the, the, a Syrian synagogue in Brooklyn is going to come to a different set of answers than the Turkish synagogue in Seattle or than the Greek synagogue downtown on, on the uh, Broom Street. Every community is going to have a different way of coping and dealing. My argument is that unless people who are intensely interested in the future of Sephardic life or Jewish life sit down and talk together, they're not going to come to any compromise or any change. And the change can't just come from above. It has to come from below or come together. So for example, let's say I'm a rabbi, some theoretical synagogue in the middle of nowhere. I'm not going to say any synagogue. My first task, if I were the rabbi, and if I were 40 years younger, I would call uh, 20, 25 people that were the 
spark plugs, men and women, younger and older, who have a, a very strong feeling for the synagogue and for the community. And I would have a two day seminar and we're gonna sit from morning till night and we're gonna talk and we're gonna think, this is our issue. We're, we're our kids, we're our grandkids. What are we doing that we feel fairly good about as our strengths and where are our weaknesses? Where are we really reaching out and where are we not reaching out? I, I know for a fact from experience, I was a rabbi for 50 years, for more than 50 years. And, and I have a wonderful synagogue, magnificent synagogue. But I can tell you without any hesitation that many people who came to synagogue, they never once thought about God. It wasn't really part of the, you come, it's nice, you, you meet your friends, there's some nice music, you have a nice kiddush afterwards, but it wasn't necessarily a religious experience. Some people come to synagogue, it's a social, social experience, it's nice which I'm not diminishing that, that's very important also. But ultimately, we have to realize we have souls. There's a religious aspiration in us. We're not just material, we're also spirit. And we often don't realize how to reach that spirit. I, I, I was at a synagogue, I'm not gonna say what synagogue, not in New York, someplace else. And they read Shira Shirim on Friday night. The, the beautiful Song of Songs. And after they read it, or before, I don't recall, they read a certain thing from the Kabbalah about the trans, transmigration of our souls. May we and our souls and our souls of souls and our other souls, may they, may the interpretation of the song of songs be understood by all of our many souls. And I'm sitting there, I said, my God, I don't believe in this. I don't think too many people in this day and age believe in this. And yet you have some pious old men saying these prayers, which are not only meaningless to, to many people, but turn us off entirely. How could I go to a synagogue and pray where these people live with their, trans, their transmigrated souls? How, how could I even sit in the same room with these people? Why would I want to have anything to do with them? If we don't analyze what we're saying in our prayers, and if we don't realize how these prayers are supposed to impact on our souls, we're on the wrong track. We're not taking ourselves seriously. <laughs> okay. It's up to each congregation, each community to pull its own self together and not to worry about what everyone else is doing. We're not in competition with anybody else. We're in competition with ourselves and we're not answerable to anybody else. We're answerable to the Almighty. And more importantly, we're answerable to our great grandchildren who are yet to come. We want to leave them something that's worthwhile. And to do that requires thoughtfulness. Are you concerned at all about uh, the loss of momentum for those who would normally attend services uh, due to things like COVID restrictions, and particularly among uh, women in general who have kind of been even more restricted uh, because of COVID restrictions and attending synagogues and virtual programs? or been liberated in some sense for allowing to attend to virtual programs instead of the synagogue itself. You know what, Co the COVID has uh, had some very positive things such as these Zoom classes. We've all learned how to use Zoom. But I wonder, I'm glad I'm not a rabbi of synagogue anymore. It's gonna be very difficult to pull a synagogue back together again after this COVID thing. I think many congregations have lost income, they've lost membership. How are they gonna get people back? I don't know. But I do know anecdotally, there, I'll tell you some examples from women and from men. There was a woman, a friend of ours, so a member of a synagogue, not in, not in Manhattan, outside of New York City. They've been members for 50 years and they were in synagogue every single Shabbat. She's a widow now. And for the first three, four, five months of COVID, she couldn't go to synagogue. She still can't, right? And she didn't get even a call from the rabbi. How are you? Are you, are you can we help you? Can we stay in touch? Didn't even get a call from the rabbi. So she gave the rabbi hell. So we've been members of the synagogue all these years and, and now you don't even give a call to see how we are. I'm a widow and left alone. I'm all alone for Shabbat, all these, and, and you don't even have a, a decency to call. I know people who had, had to go to hospitals and surgery and the rabbi or community leaders don't even call to say hello. 
How are you doing? Don't even send you an email, nothing. When synagogues don't feel love, don't feel a connection with the people, people are not dumb. People, it reciprocates. If you don't love me, it's gonna be hard for me to love you. And if you abandon me when I need you, it's hard for me to forget that. And therefore, I think synagogues are gonna have a heck of a time. In, in New York, I get, I get a lot of emails from different synagogues. And there's some synagogues are, I think, just terrible, terrible. And some, the rabbis are outstanding. They're, they're with the people. They, here's where you get your vaccine shot. Here's where you, if, you're, if you need food, we'll send you some food. If you're alone for Shabbat, we'll, we'll, we'll provide for you. They, they're, they care. They're, they're alive. So even after COVID, people are going to come back to that synagogue. But for people who are part of a congregation that doesn't care if they're alive or dead, they're not going to come back. Or they were not going to come back as lovingly or happily, and they're not going to be as generous. It's, I, I, worry, I worry about the future of synagogues. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it at there, but I want to thank Rabbi Angel so much for this wonderful first talk in our four-part series on contemporary Jewish issues from the Sephardic perspective. Please make sure to join us back next week, inshallah, at the Keda al Deal for part two. And we'll be also posting this on uh, the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals YouTube page, as well as on our Sephardic Wildland Facebook page to make sure in case you missed any parts you want to share with your friends, to make sure you can check it back online. And it'll be the same link as well for next week. Next week, we'll be talking about, um, I believe, the issues of conversion and intermarriage, right, Rabbi? That's right. Excellent. And it'll be a fascinating discussion, which I, I've got, inshallah, will be uh, with you all again next week. So, Rabbi, as always, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much.